Normally, a runway is not that interesting. It's just a strip of grey where your summer holiday begins and ends. But this runway is special because of the machine it was built for. Welcome to the SLF at Kennedy Space Center, Florida, the Shuttle Landing Facility. This is where, 78 times, the Space Shuttle came back to Earth. Major touchdown. The Space Shuttle retired in 2011. It flew 135 missions, launched and serviced satellites, helped build the International Space Station, and allowed astronauts to... Well, they say they were conducting science experiments, but it looks awfully like they were just having a right laugh floating around in zero gravity. Designed for low Earth orbit, the shuttle was never meant to take mankind back to the moon or to be on Mars. It was a truck, lugging stuff about 250 miles straight up into the heavens. And these days, it's just a museum piece. So why am I making a fuss about it? Well, you see, Apollo stopped doing its thing about two decades before I was born, but I do remember space shuttle launches, occasionally appearing on the news and even watching a few live on YouTube, actually. And when you start to realise how the shuttle was designed and built and what it could do, you should understand that this is not just Earth's removals lorry. This was the most complicated, most powerful machine ever made. As you probably know, the shuttle was created to solve the problem of rocket launches being incredibly wasteful. Only a tiny portion of the Saturn V rockets that took man to the moon ever made it back to Earth, and what did was basically scrap. If space travel was going to become as routine as NASA hoped, what we needed was a reusable rocket ship. And the principle really was incredibly simple. The astronauts go in the white and black bit. That's called the orbiter. That's basically the space plane part of it. They sit up here in the front and under your cargo bay doors, that's where your cargo goes. Fine. It's powered by three RS-25 SSMEs, space shuttle main engines, drinking liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that's stored in this great big orange tank. But that still needs some help to get into orbit. So then you add on your white fireworks, the SRBs, the solid rocket boosters. And when the whole thing's lit off at liftoff, you have seven million pounds of thrust. About two minutes after launch, the SRBs are finished with, so they are jettisoned. The shuttle carries on, drinking fuel out of the orange tank for another few minutes. And then, the clever bit, that all detaches, falls back into the ocean, and the solid rocket boosters could be reused. Meanwhile, the shuttle does its mission, and then when it's finished with, it comes back to Earth like a plane. It just glides down. Heat-proof tiles stop it melting as it comes through the atmosphere, and then you simply lock down your landing gear and touch back down in Florida. Beautifully simple, isn't it? Now, it just took some very clever people to design everything I just said, build it, and then find some very, very brave people to fly it. It took 13 years and about $10 billion until the first shuttle lifted off in 1981. And it soon became clear that the dream of a shuttle launch every week was a bit ambitious, given just how brutal a mission was for the vehicle. But what's amazing to me is that besides the Challenger and Columbia tragedies, shuttle missions quickly stopped making the news. Human beings have had a short attention span problem long before TikTok was a thing, okay? In 1969, 650 million people worldwide watched Apollo 11 land on the moon. It's estimated that 94% of all the television sets in the United States were watching Neil Armstrong's One Small Step, which does make me wonder, actually, what were the other 6% watching? That must have been a hell of an episode of The Price is Right. Anyway, four months after that, 
Apollo 12 successfully landed the third and fourth human beings on the lunar surface. And do you know their names? No, neither do I. Had to Wikipedia them. They're not household names, despite the fact they did this incredible thing. What is it about us as, as humans, as a species? We do the impossible and then we get bored of it. And this is my point, you see. Human beings have an incredible talent for building the impossible, for creating machines like the Space Shuttle that push the very limits of engineering, maths, science and technology. But we also have this weird knack for ceasing to care about them the second they're finished. Instead, we start complaining that they're too expensive and asking, well, what was the point in that? Funny thing is that the been there, done that, don't care anymore mentality, well, it doesn't just apply to spaceships, it also affects one supercar more than any other. When Volkswagen resurrected the Bugatti brand, the targets it set were so ambitious, some of the engineers threw their hands up and walked out. Those that stayed were tasked with creating a car that developed 1,000 horsepower and could achieve a top speed of over 400 kilometers an hour, or as near as, damn it, 250 miles an hour. After almost five years of toil, the Veyron rose to that challenge. Its eight litre quad turbo W16 engine pushed it to 253 miles an hour. Bugatti had established itself as the makers of the new world's fastest road car. So Bugatti's been busy, hasn't it? Refining that W16 hypercar concept over the years with Veyron and the Supersport and then the Chiron up to this monster. And yet, despite that, there's always the back chat, isn't there? Oh, it's just the thousand horsepower Audi TT. It's a three million pound Volkswagen. Where's the soul? It's just a numbers car. So I thought that since this is about to become a museum piece, like the Space Shuttle, it's about to be out of commission, retired, a piece of history. Let's have one last adventure and remember what Bugatti did for us. Now let me blow your mind. When the shuttle used to touch down right here, it came in hot, right? It landed at 225 miles an hour. That's 100 miles an hour quicker than the touchdown speed of a commercial airliner. I mean, it's no wonder that the astronauts used to call the thing the flying brick. It basically fell out of the sky. Now, I'm never going to get the opportunity to go into outer space, but today, this is about as close as I'm going to get, okay? The shuttle used to land at 225. Today, I've got the opportunity to take you down here, down the SLF, at shuttle landing speed, or maybe a little bit quicker than that. Let's see how we go. And I have the weapon of choice, Bugatti Chiron Super Sport. 1,600 horsepower, naught to 125 miles an hour in five seconds, which is pathetic and rubbish, because a space shuttle had 37 million brake horsepower and could do five miles a second. Bond for main engine start, we have main engine. 320 miles per hour. Linus his nose being now rotated down toward the runway. Now a little bit about this mad runway before we set off. I'm just getting down to the bottom end where we're going to start the run. What can I tell you? It's 15,000 feet long, which is 2.8 miles plus a bit of runoff that we really hopefully won't need. It's 300 feet wide, which is really disorientating. And this place is now home to 4,000 alligators. They're all in the swamp out there. It's brilliant, isn't it, boys and girls? You come to Florida and even the speed bumps have got teeth. We have ignition. I'm gonna trickle the car off the line, look after the gearbox and give it everything. This is a fun day at work. Three, two, one, and... Oh. Heck, it does not hang about this thing! Fastest I've ever driven is 189 miles an hour down the Molson straight at the bottom. 
We're gonna blitz that today. Just a slight weave. No idea what the speed is. I can't look. I'm just looking for the breaking point. God, this thing's long. Got a slight weave. I can see the braking sign. Good Lord! That's hard on the brakes, that's big G's! We got the air brake up! It's so disorientating, I can still be over it. That's still 90 miles an hour! Oh my Lord. That is as exciting as driving in a straight line goes. I got the top speed down here. <laughs> Is it mad that I'm disappointed that it's 249 miles an hour? That's the fastest I'm ever gonna go in a streetcar. Holy Christ. It just started to weave above what must have been about 220, but it still felt so solid. And if you're watching this going, all right, mate, dry your trousers. I've seen a Bugatti go really fast before. I've seen a Bugatti go faster. Thank you. That is exactly my point. The very fact that we don't even care about this car being able to stroll along to 250 miles an hour, the fact that it seems so routine, that is why this thing is such a moment. It's why it is one of the greats for me. This car is an automotive god. Turns out the car's speedo was under reading ever so slightly. It said 249 mile an hour VMAX inside, but when we got the GPS data back, it proved that for a precious tenth of a second or two, I'd cracked 402 kilometers an hour, which is a nice round 250 miles an hour. So I'm into the 400 club, a whisker over 250, and that means I've gone down here a lot faster than any space shuttle ever did. <laughs> that was one of the most mind pulverizing experiences I've ever had in a car. I mean, I've come over all glib and go, I was out of this world, but no, I mean, what a place, what a privilege, what a machine. And be nice to people who like science because they bring you spaceships and stuff like that.